and a past that is now lost forever. There was a time when the land was sacred and the ancient ones were as one with it. A time when only the children of the Great Spirit were here to light their fires in these places with no boundaries. When the forests were as thick as the fur of the winter bear. When a warrior could walk from horizon to horizon on the backs of the buffalo. When the deserts were in bloom and the streams pure as freshly fallen snow. In that time when there were only simple ways, I saw with my heart the conflicts to come. And whether it was to be for good or bad, what was certain was that there would be change. In the pre-dawn hours of March the 6th, 1836, a vastly outnumbered group of patriots, armed only with their rifles, their courage, and their eternal belief in liberty, fell to a superior force at an abandoned frontier mission. The battle took about 90 minutes. But in the decades since, that event has become the substance of myth and legend. As compelling as the legend is, the true story is every bit as powerful. The story is the Battle of the Alamo. The cause of philanthropy, of humanity, of liberty, and human happiness throughout the world called loudly on every man who can to aid Texas. If we succeed, the country is ours. It is immense in extent and fertile in its soil and will amply reward all our toil. If we fail, death in the cause of liberty is not cause for shuddering. Daniel W. Cloud, Alamo Defender, December 1835. You ask me, do I remember it? I tell you, yes. It is burned in my brain and indelibly seared there. Neither age nor infirmity could make me forget. For well, the scene was one of such horror that it could never have been forgotten by anyone who witnessed its incidents. Enrique Esparza, survivor of the Battle of the Alamo, May 1907. Texans think that they are somehow a bit separate from the rest of us uh, in these United States, and, and perhaps they're right. Uh, and they have the Alamo to turn to. Even when you strip away uh, all the embellishment, it's, it's, a, it's uh, impressive in its heroism. If you examine uh, the annals of American history, particularly American military history, you really can't find anything that uh, comes close to what happened on March 6th, 1836. The Battle of the Alamo was completely unnecessary. It should have never taken place. The story of the Alamo is one in which the facts are few, the myths are many, and the controversies abound. It begins in the early 18th century when Texas was a distant land of the Spanish Empire. The Spanish moved into Texas, as they did throughout the Southwest, of course, in, in search of gold and also in search of souls to save. Uh, they found no gold in Texas. 
But still, they just found the souls, and so they built their missions, fortified them to uh, hoard off the uh, Comanches who came from the north, and tried to uh, make Texas a, a colony of uh, the far-flung Spanish Empire. But they were never very successful. The Indians didn't care much for mission life. The missions uh, quickly deteriorated and fell into ruin. One of these missions was San Antonio de Valero, located just outside the town of Bejar. It's basically abandoned in 1793, and it doesn't pick up its Alamo name until a Spanish uh, military garrison is stationed there in the early 19th century. And this uh, second flying company came from a small town in Coahuila known as El Alamo. Alamo, the Spanish word for cottonwood, is the name that would last long after the Spaniards left Mexico. Devastated by the high costs, both human and economic, of winning a war against Spain for independence in 1821, Mexico sought to revitalize itself by opening up its northeastern province, Texas, for sale. All this happened to coincide with uh, times which weren't overly good, and uh, people in this country at that time had a very easy way to get back into prosperity if things had gone wrong. They simply got up and moved. A few conditions were placed upon the new Mexicans coming from the United States, and that is they would have to subscribe, uh, take an oath of allegiance to the Mexican government. They would have to convert to Catholicism and uh, reject slavery. The land speculators who brought these new settlers to Texas were called impresarios. The first and most prominent one was Stephen F. Austin, a Missourian who was fulfilling his father's dream of moving to Texas. Austin was perhaps the most moderate of the early leaders of Texas. He tried to work within the Mexican system. He seemed to uh, genuinely regard himself as a citizen of Mexico rather than uh, seeing Texas as uh, simply a temporary uh, way station on the way to uh, American annexation. To the settlers in Austin's settlement, fellow citizens, the Mexican government has been bountiful in the favors and privileges which she has granted to the settlement, in return for which all she asks is that you be firm supporters and defenders of the independence and liberty of the Mexican nation, that you should industriously cultivate the soil that is granted you, that you should strictly obey the laws of the constituted authorities, and in fact, that you should be good citizens and virtuous men. Stephen F. Austin, July 1823. The earliest settlers uh, in Texas, those who came with Austin and the other impresarios, were sober, hardworking, industrious people who tended to obey the laws of the Republic of Mexico uh, and uh, who tended to prosper in this new land. It was a, a glorious place. Texas became, <laughs> was referred to at, at that time as uh, heaven for men and dogs and hell on women and oxen. And that was pretty much the way it was. It was a man's paradise. But the seeds of discontent were being sown along with the crops. Though Mexico ratified a constitution in 1824 based on the American model, the document required Texas and its neighbor, Coahuila, to form a single state. In doing so, Texas lost much of its representation and began to grow distant from the government in Mexico City. Still, Americans kept pouring in. As there were continuing economic depressions in the United States, more and more American adventurers, more and more people of broken fortunes moved to Texas. It was the borderland, of course. It provided a safe haven from the law, but it also provided a new start. One such new arrival was a larger-than-life character who would figure prominently in the Alamo story, Jim Bowie. It's difficult to separate Bowie the legend from Bowie the man because of his many exploits. At the sandbar door, for instance, he was shot, stabbed, pistol whipped, ran through the chest with a sword cane, yet he still had the chance to get up and kill one man and wound another. At the Battle of Nacogdoches, with 18 to 20 men, he bluffed 310 Mexicans into surrendering. At the San Saba Indian Battle, with 10 men, he defeated 164 Indians. At Mission Conception, with 92 men, he defeated 400 Mexican soldiers. And at one point, Bowie himself ran out, captured a Mexican cannon, and turned it on the enemy. And this is the stuff we can document. Adding to the Bowie legend is not so much his shady land deals back in Arkansas, 
or even his slave trading with the pirate Jean Lafitte, as it is the knife that bears his name. This is an original Bowie knife that's been documented with metallurgical tests and in Sam Houston's personal memoirs of what a Bowie knife during the Alamo period looked like. As you can see, it's got a swag back with a clip point of blade. The proper way to hold a Bowie knife is in this fashion. You would block or parry the opponent's blade, cut into their hand, and then go into their stomach and rip up as you pull out. Unlike most of the new arrivals who made their homes in the colonies of East Texas, Bowie settled further west on the Texas frontier in the town of Bejar, the center of native Mexican Texan life. This was a community that had deep roots, that had its own organization, that had its own identity. They had formed communities that go back to the early 18th century, a hundred years before the Anglo-Americans arrived here. Bowie endeared himself to the Tejana community, in part by marrying the governor's daughter, Ursula Viramendi. Bowie's relationship with the Tejanos in San Antonio can be best illustrated by the name they gave him, Santiago Bowie. Santiago translates into St. James. This is due, I think, largely for his many deeds and so forth that he did. Uh, one example is that he saw a little Mexican boy that was drowning in the San Antonio River and saved his life. The little boy was named was Enrique Esparza. American settlers came to Texas by the thousands, and by 1830, they made up 75% of the province's population. This wasn't really a problem in numbers, but uh, the, the Americans brought with them their traditions, their culture, uh, their beliefs and ideas, which included their representative democracy, the profit motive, freedom of enterprise, and of course, the peculiar institution, slavery. Conflicts between the American settlers and the Mexican government were inevitable. The conflicts that Anglo-Americans had with the Mexican government had to do with economic issues. Economic issues, of course, translated into political questions. What were those economic issues? The economic issues were trade, slavery, immigration. The Mexican government banned all three in the law of April 6, 1830. As a result of this decree of 1830, uh, the mindset of some of the Texians changed to start to consider what might be an independence movement. An independence movement that would receive its greatest inspiration six years later at the Alamo. The growing number of American settlers in Texas meant increasing conflicts with an unstable Mexican government. These continuing differences stirred the simmering unrest and guaranteed that it was just a matter of time before events would explode into revolution. In spite of the restrictive law of April 6, 1830, Americans still found ways to come to Texas. One of those who did was a former school teacher from South Carolina who would also play a major role in the Alamo story, William Barrett Travis. Like so many people who came to Texas, Travis followed a broken heart. Uh, his marriage with uh, a young student of his, Rosanna Cato, dissolved. There were rumors that she had been unfaithful with another man. Uh, rumors, in fact, that Travis had killed the man. But uh, I have been able to find no evidence that, that supports that. That's in the realm of, of folklore. Also in the realm of folklore is that Travis came from an aristocratic background. He was anything but that. He was plain, he was plain folk, and uh, his education was uh, rudimentary at best. In 1832, a year after Travis's arrival, Sam Houston also came to Texas. The youngest governor in Tennessee history, the protege of Andrew Jackson. Everyone thought he was going to follow Jackson into the White House, but a failed marriage uh, sends him into uh, uh, a life among the Cherokees and, uh, and the habitual uh, love of the bottle. And then he finally moves to Texas, working for uh, New York land speculating companies, and uh, 
sees a way to redeem himself as the leader in a new land. Meanwhile, Mexico was in the throes of yet another revolution. The Texans favored Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana in his quest for power. In 1832, he supported the rebellion to reestablish the federal constitution in Mexico. As a matter of fact, the Texans supported him. And when they fought the skirmish at Velasco, they were yelling, Viva Santa Ana. He's just a fascinating figure, charismatic, handsome, a true leader, no question about it, but also autocratic, uh, stubborn, uh, hungering after glory, with unbelievable delusions of grandeur. When Santa Ana came to power in 1835, he overturned the federal constitution of 1824, centralized the government, and declared himself dictator of Mexico. No sooner did he come to power when he proved to be a very cynical opportunist, and uh, immediately began cracking down on the Anglo-Americans in Texas, strengthening the rules, cutting back, back on the grants of land. It became harder and harder to get a grant. Texans were divided on what to do next. There were those uh, who sometimes referred to as the Peace Party, led by Stephen Austin, who were for a conciliation with Mexico, trying to live within the guidelines of the uh, basically liberal constitution of 1824. There were others, the so-called War Party, including William Barrett Travis and James Bowie, who thought that independence was the only proper way to go. Santa Ana sent his brother-in-law, General Martin Perfecto de Cas, to quell mounting civil unrest in Texas. I make it known to every one of the inhabitants of Texas that any attempt to disturb the public order and peace, that the inevitable consequences of war will bear upon them and their property. Martin Perfecto de Cos, July 1835. Three months later, the event that sparked the Texas Revolution took place here on the banks of the Guadalupe River at Gonzales, Texas. General Koss sent some troops to reclaim a cannon left there to defend the town against Indian attacks. The uh, Texans hoisted a flag with a little picture of a cannon on it that said, come and take it, the Mexicans tried. The Texans fired off some shots. The Mexicans decided it'd be better to go back to San Antonio. And lo and behold, all the Texans followed them there. And soon, uh, an army under Stephen F. Austin was laying siege uh, to uh, General Koss in San Antonio. He retired into the dubious safety of a mission called the Alamo uh, and uh, hoped for reinforcements that, uh, that never came. Koss's troops and Texan forces engaged in the Battle of Bejar, also known as San Antonio, from December 5th through 9th, 1835. Koss surrendered his troops, who were given parole, and uh, allowed to return safely to Mexico so long as they promised not to uh, take up arms again against Texas, a promise that Koss promptly broke. That promise was broken when the tables were turned three months later at the Alamo. The news of the Texan victory at Bejar reached Santa Ana in Mexico. Infuriated by this humiliating defeat, Santa Ana decided to take matters into his own hands. In January 1836, he began his march against Texas with over 4,000 men with the sole purpose of annihilating those perfidious foreigners once and for all. The momentous year of 1836 began with 80 volunteers occupying the Alamo. As they set about arming the former mission with artillery left by General Koss's troops, the Texans faced major problems. The first problem with the Alamo is the fact it's in San Antonio and it's 90 miles away from everybody else. So it is a difficult post to reinforce. Sam Houston realized that the Alamo had no strategic value whatsoever that for the Texans to uh, hole up in small, isolated forts uh, on the exposed frontiers of Texas was suicide. The second problem would be the size of the fortification. They have a huge compound, over three acres. Imagine, if you will, a football field uh, surrounded by adobe walls, plus a courtyard and a church and a cattle pen, et cetera. You can't defend that with 200 men, and probably not even 600. Uh, the other problem is, is that that compound was designed as a mission 
and the walls were there to keep the neophyte tribesmen in and the warlike Comanches out. Uh, and it served that purpose very well. Uh, those adobe walls were never meant to withstand artillery. Knowing this, Sam Houston, commanding general of the fledgling Texan army, sent Jim Bowie to the Alamo. Sam Houston claimed that he sent Bowie with orders to destroy the Alamo. Bowie arrives in January, expects to see a dilapidated mission, and is rather impressed by the fortification. And he sends back a letter, we would rather die in these ditches than give them up to the enemy. The enemy, Santa Ana, had his own reasons for wanting the Alamo. It had been defended, of course, previously by Koss, Santa Ana's brother-in-law. This stain to Mexican honor is a particularly dark stain on Santa Ana's family tree. The Alamo must be retaken. He must restore Mexican honor and thus his own honor. To achieve this, Santa Ana ordered 4,000 soldiers to march into Texas. Our misconception is, is that the Mexican army was a bunch of peony, serape-clad rabble, and they weren't. The Mexican army was one of the finest forces when properly led, when properly led. In the dead of winter, the Mexican army began its long trek northward. It was the first time that our soldiers would be dealing with men of a different language and a different religion, men whose character and habits were likewise different from ours. All was new in this war, and although it was happening on our own soil, it seemed as if it were in a foreign land. Lieutenant Colonel Jose Enrique de la Peña January, 1835. That same month, provisional governor Henry Smith assigned cavalryman William Barrett Travis to the Alamo. Uh, Travis did not want to go to the Alamo. Uh, he did not think that uh, that was the proper duty station for a cavalryman. He didn't want to be cooped up in this, uh, in between four walls. To His Excellency Henry Smith, Governor of Texas, I beg that Your Excellency will recall the order for me to go to Behar in command of so few men. I am unwilling to risk my reputation, which is ever so dear to a soldier, by going off into the enemy's country with such little means and so few men. William Barrett Travis, January 29th, 1835. He followed his orders and went where he was ordered. Uh, once there, it seems that Bowie convinced him that this wasn't really a bad place to defend Texas because shortly thereafter, he's describing the Alamo as the key to Texas. To His Excellency Henry Smith, governor of Texas, we consider death preferable to disgrace which would be the result of giving up a post which had been so dearly won and thus opening the door for the invaders to enter the sacred territory of the colonies. This point is the key to Texas. William Barrett Travis, February 12, 1836. Days after Travis's men arrived in Behar, so did a living legend from Tennessee, David Crockett. His defeat in the election of 1835 for his congressional seat uh, was a hard blow. 49 years old, hardly better off financially than he had been 20 years before. Uh, a man who had been to the White House, who had been at the pinnacle of power, and now seemed to have been cast aside. And so he started off for Texas, started off to Texas to build a new life. My dear son and daughter, I must say as to what I have seen of Texas, it is the garden spot of the world. The best land and best prospects for health I ever saw. And I do believe it is a fortune to any man to come here. I have taken the oath of the government and enrolled my name as a volunteer for six months. I am rejoiced at my fate. Your affectionate father, David Crockett, January, 1835. He writes home that he's joined the Texas Army because everyone who joins gets to vote and also everyone who joins gets to run for the Constitutional Convention. He's going to be the founding father of a new republic.
February 23rd, noon, a church bell signaled the alarm. After covering 365 miles in only 29 days, advanced elements of the Mexican army entered Bejar. I was playing with some other children on the plaza when Santa Ana and his soldiers came up. He had a very broad face and high cheekbones. He had a very cruel look. It has haunted me ever since. We ran off and told our parents, who took us into the Alamo, Enrique Esparza. Having taken Bejar without firing a shot, Santa Ana offered a truce to Travis and Bowie, who shared command of the 150 or so men who took refuge in the Alamo. They don't trust uh, Santa Ana's promises at all, and uh, his offer of, uh, of surrender at discretion does not not seem the better part of valor to them, and they're right. With the truce offer rejected, Santa Ana's siege of the Alamo began. Artillery positions were established across the San Antonio River, opposite the Alamo. Those guns are set up at very maximum ranges. So the shot and the shell is literally lobbing into the Alamo. It's not doing as much damage as it's doing psychological problems on the defenders by keeping them ducking and just keeping them up and, and constantly tense. On February 24th, the second day of the siege, Jim Bowie became seriously ill. One of the attending physicians at the Alamo called it a peculiar disease of a peculiar nature. Traditional accounts call it typhoid pneumonia. Later accounts have called it tuberculosis. So whatever was going on, Bowie was out of it, enough so that he turns command over to Travis, and Travis is able to assume full command of the Alamo. While Santa Ana's men began their bombardment of the Alamo, Travis sent a courier for aid with the following letter. To the people of Texas and all Americans in the world, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have sustained a continual bombardment and cannonade for 24 hours and have lost not a man. The enemy has demanded surrender at discretion. I shall never surrender or retreat. I call on you in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything that is dear in the American character to come to our aid with all dispatch, victory or death. William Barrett Travis, February 24th, 1836. The view today is that Travis was an idiot who through some uh, grand desire to be rendered immortal sacrificed his men. Uh, that, that's, that's poppycock. From um, the very first letter he wrote, uh, although uh, embellished with, with all this patriotic grandiloquence, it nonetheless says, I need help. Come help me. The most logical place for help to come from was 90 miles away in the town of Goliad, the location of Fort Defiance, commanded by Colonel James Fannin. He had over 320 men. Um, he knew about the siege almost the day it started. Um, so why didn't he just say, boys, let's go up to San Antonio? Fannin knows that if he supports Travis at the Alamo, that the more direct route to the Texas settlements is left wide open. Uh, Goliad is the front door, and the Alamo is the back door. It made absolutely no sense strategically to guard the back door and leave the front door open. Fannin was weak, indecisive, timid. He made one effort to relieve the Alamo, but uh, his wagons broke down, the oxen roamed off. It seemed like a bad day to march all the way to Bayar. Eventually, some help came from the town where the Texan Revolution started. As a matter of fact, the only relief column that came was the one from Gonzales, which was the nearest place to the Alamo. And those men marched down and came in in the middle of the night uh, through the Mexican lines. And it was a tremendous, caused a tremendous boost in the spirits of the men in the Alamo. But 32 men from Gonzales were not enough. By March 5th, the Mexicans were within rifle range of the Alamo. 
After having endured 12 days of siege and realizing that aid, if it was coming at all, would not arrive in time, Travis, the story goes, gathered all the defenders together. Of all the myths at the Alamo, uh, none conjures up more bravery, courage, and romanticism than at some time in March during the siege, William Barrett Travis drawing a line in the dirt with his sword, asking those members of the garrison to cross the line, to stay with him, to fight with him, and to die with him. It's the event that makes the Alamo unique among last stand stories. Because here are the men of the Alamo asked to vote with their bodies. And who were these men? They were doctors, lawyers, and farmers, most of whom did not have any real military experience. Many were new arrivals to Texas from the United States and even Europe. Some were from old Tejano families in Bejar. Some, like David Crockett and Jim Bowie, were famous. Others, like Daniel Cloud, were barely known. But regardless of their backgrounds, they had one thing in common. They were united in the cause of Texas independence. All but one, the story goes, crossed the line. A Frenchman named Moses Rose decided that uh, he'd like to live a little longer. And uh, he went over the wall and vanished into the darkness beyond. The account of this uh, really doesn't uh, pop up until generations later. Uh, in all probability, Travis did not draw a line, but clearly, from a personal psychological standpoint, all of those 189 defenders did cross an imaginary line uh, to their deaths. But by crossing that line, they also stepped into the realm of mythology. Santa Ana called himself the Napoleon of the West, and his battle plan to attack the Alamo would have impressed the French emperor. The plan was that at about 4.30 in the morning, the combined battalions of the Mexican army, broken up into four assault columns, would assault the Alamo. They would do so under the cover of darkness at a time which is the absolute worst for the human condition. Three of the columns were designated to attack in the northern end of the Alamo, one directly against the north wall, one against the western side, and one against the eastern face. A fourth column was designed to keep the south end busy. Hope stirred within us, and within a few moments, this anxious uncertainty would disappear. An insult to our arms had to be avenged, as well as the blood of our friends spilled three months before within the walls we're about to attack. Lieutenant Colonel Jose Enrique de la Peña, at the designated hour, Santa Ana signaled his bugler to play the Deguelo, the traditional Spanish march of no quarter. And 1,800 of his troops advanced on the Alamo. Unfortunately, some of the battalions started getting patriotic and started yelling, Viva Santa Ana, Viva La Republica Mexico. And the surprise element was lost. Now alerted to the oncoming Mexicans 250 yards away, the Alamo defenders rushed to their positions and showered them with bullets and cannon fire. The artillery fire is so hard against them that the columns at the west and the east merge and start heading in toward the north, which isn't a plan, but works out beautifully for them. Because it puts so many men underneath that wall, there's absolutely no way the Texas could ever respond to stop it. Atop that wall at the Alamo's north end stood William Barrett Travis, encouraging his men and fighting off the enemy. Colonel Travis may have been one of the first Alamo defenders to fall. The cause of his death was a 75 caliber musket ball fired from a Brown Bess musket of a Mexican infantryman shot in the head. So his death probably came very swiftly. A letter was supposedly removed from Travis's body at the battle and later published in a Mexican newspaper. The letter was from his close friend, Robert Williamson, also called Three-Legged Willie, because of a wooden limb attached to a leg bent backward by illness. The letter dated March 1st informed Travis that as many as 300 reinforcements were on their way and implored him to hold out until they arrived. Within the battle's first 20 minutes, Mexican forces breached the north wall and poured into the compound. Their men rushed in on us. They swarmed among us and over us. They fired on us in volumes. In the dark, our men groped and grasped the throats of our foes and buried their knives into their hearts. 
Enrique Esparza. What happens at this point is many of the Texans have fallen back into the lawn barracks. That's the scene of the worst hand-to-hand -hand fighting of the morning. And it's bloody, it's long, it's savage, it's bitter. A horrible carnage took place, and some were trampled to death. But tumult was great, the disorder frightful. Any moderation in relating it would fall short. Jose Enrique de la Peña. The carnage spread to the low barrack at the south end. In one of its rooms lay Jim Bowie in his sick bed. The public image of Bowie well, doesn't seem to want to accept anything else than Bowie fighting to the death and making his last stand. In reality, he probably maybe got one shot off if he was lucky, and they were on him. David Crockett and his Tennessee boys, as they were called, were assigned by Travis to defend the picket fence by the church, the most vulnerable point in the compound. What happened after that is cause of much debate. On one hand, we have contemporary accounts from the spring of 1836 in Eastern newspapers, which suggest that Crockett went down fighting like a tiger. On the other hand, our Mexican accounts, like the so-called De La Pena account, uh, translated in the mid-1970s, which suggested that he surrendered. Some seven men had survived the general carnage, and under the protection of General Castrillon, they were brought before Santa Ana. Among them was David Crockett. Santa Ana answered Castrillon's intervention on Crockett's behalf with a gesture of indignation and addressing the troops closest to him, ordered his execution. Though tortured before they were killed, these unfortunates died without complaining and without humiliating themselves. Jose Enrique de la Peña. And there is even one account um, in this newspaper, the Monroe Democrat. This is from New York State dated Tuesday, April 5th, 1836, uh, that describes another outcome of the battle. Davy Crockett, not dead. We are happy to state on the authority of a letter from Tennessee that the report of the death of the eccentric Davy Crockett is not true. He stated, says the letter, on a hunting expedition to the Rocky Mountains was his main objective, and then dropped down into Texas. But we expect him home early in the spring. The battle lasted about 90 minutes and was over by dawn. There were bodies everywhere. All of the 189 defenders were dead. Of the 1,800 Mexicans that took part in the attack, 600 lost their lives. The survivors were mostly the women and children of the defenders. Among them was the family of Gregorio Esparza, including his eight-year-old son, Enrique. The Esparzas were brought before Santa Ana. Where is your husband, Santa Ana asked. My mother answered sobbing, he's dead in the Alamo. Santa Ana then asked where the other members of the family were. She replied that a brother of my father was in his Santa Ana's army. This was true. It was this brother, Francisco Esparza, who later asked and received permission to search among the slain for my father's corpse. My uncle found my father's body and had it buried. Enrique Esparza. Santa Ana ordered that all the other bodies of the defenders be burned immediately. But before doing so, he proclaimed that what had occurred in the pre-dawn darkness at the Alamo was but a small affair. The battle of the Alamo was completely unnecessary. Santa Ana wanted an impressive victory the Napoleon of the West wanted to have a bloody banner to wave in front of everyone, all rebels, whether they be Mexican, Tejano, Texan, or American volunteer, and say, this is what we will do to rebels. We don't care how much Mexican blood it takes. This is what we will do. Within a few hours, a funeral pyre rendered into ashes those men who moments before had been so brave that in a blind fury, they had unselfishly offered their lives and met their ends in combat. The bodies with their blackened and bloodied faces disfigured by a desperate death, their hair and uniforms burning at once, presented a dreadful and truly hellish sight. 
What trophies? Those of the battlefield. Jose Enrique de la Peña. The impact the Battle of the Alamo had on the Texans was immediate and dramatic. Texas is so disorganized. It's going to be the, the slaughter at the Alamo that's going to provide the rallying point for all of Texans. That's going to convince the Texans that they better pull together. They better stop arguing among themselves and grab a gun, or uh, they're all going to meet the same fate as the defenders of the Alamo. In contrast, the battle had a negative effect on the Mexican forces. That battle messes with the morale of the Mexican army. The common foot soldado understood that there's no reason that we should have done this. They did it because they were soldiers, and they did it for the, the honor of their nation. But they were sitting there afterwards saying, why did we ever go and do this thing? Only three weeks after the Battle of the Alamo, the Mexican army massacred Colonel Fannin and over 350 of his men at Goliath. With the Alamo and Fort Defiance now out of the way, Mexican forces pressed eastward into the colonies. But the Texan revenge came swiftly on April 21st. With the battle cries of remember Goliad and remember the Alamo, another outnumbered Texan force, this time commanded by Sam Houston, routed the Mexicans in an 18-minute bloodletting at San Jacinto. The wounded Houston rode among his men trying to halt the wanton slaughter of helpless soldados, many of whom begged for their lives, crying, me no Alamo. Mino Goliad. Seeing the futility of his efforts, he admonished, Gentlemen, I applaud your bravery, but damn your manners. Texas Almanac, 1859. Other Texan officers attempted to restore order, but as one enraged volunteer told Colonel John Austin Wharton, if Jesus Christ were to come down from heaven and order me to quit shooting yellow bellies, I wouldn't do it, sir. Joe Dixon, Texan soldier, Battle of San Jacinto. With the surrender of Santa Ana, independence for Texas was assured. But in the end, it's the Battle of the Alamo that's remembered best. Because all Americans, really all people everywhere, can identify with the heroic sacrifice of Crockett, Bowie, and Travis. No matter the details of how someone died, no matter whether the line in the dust was ever drawn, no matter how many Mexicans there were in Santa Ana's army, no matter whether there was any strategic value to that defense or not, those men still fought and died for liberty, fought and died for their democratic ideals. That's something we always need to remember in this country. I think it's a great example for us that instead of always gauging the odds in any position we take, that there are some things that are so important that you do them even if all the odds are against you. We don't really think in those terms today, but I think we could use a little bit of it. In a time when America talks about values and a return to values, we find people are reluctant to open doors for individuals. Then what does it take to give up your life for someone else? That is the story of the Alamo. You ask me, do I remember it? I tell you, yes. It is burned in my brain and indelibly seared there. Neither age nor infirmity could make me forget, for the scene was one of such horror that it could never have been forgotten by anyone who witnessed its incidents. Throughout history, symbols have been used to inspire passion for a cause. The Alamo was such a symbol. Its lasting image is a tangible reminder that the cause of liberty is worth dying for. And the strengths of that symbol have proven so powerful that generations continue to remember the Alamo.